Hi right, lads, we're we're live here. Jesus. Uh we're back here for another week with Seven Stephen. Um for the chats. So this week, lads, we'll we got to the uh reviewing the games obviously from Division One and Division Two. Um we had Mayo versus Tyrone, Kerry, uh Armagh, Dublin, or sorry, Galway, Donegal, Monaghan and Roscommon. And Division two, 2 was uh, Dublin Clare, Derry and Kildare, lads. And we'll talk about a uh, little debate going on here. Who will be the... We went on about the five most skillful players last last week. We're, we're going back the way now. We're on about the, the top five defenders. So this should be um, this should be interesting to put it like that. But I don't know. Stephen, how's the form? How are you getting on? Not too bad, Enda. Not too bad. The last time I was chatting to you, you were, you were playing down Mayo's chances. And now it's just getting... <laughs> The hype is real. The hype is real. The hype is real. Believe me. Believe No, listen, they were impressive. They were impressive again at the weekend. Uh, albeit, I think Jerome were very poor as well. Um, all all doesn't seem to be well there for for some reason. We chatted about it last week, like, but um, Jesus, it was some of the defending was very very poor. Uh, which which uh, has put them in a bit of trouble now because. I stopped it. just one example that I was sh- Jim O'Connor's goal literally took yeah. a given goal, given goal, and ran 50 meters. And yeah, I it was like the Red Sea. I, I literally seen, I've never seen anything like that, especially from a Tyrone team, yeah, in my lifetime. And it was, it was incredible, yeah. I think a lot of people are sort of shocked about it, you know. Um, a lot of people are sort of shocked at, at, at how open they are, um. You know, I, I've said before, I think a couple of weeks ago, I said to you, I think you know, Tyrone are the sort of team that sort of need a need a bit of a cause. You know, they need a they need a, a siege mentality, circle the wagons type excuse. You know, um, and like to be fair, you know, like I, I I just think if they go back, if they don't go back very very quickly to 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 making themselves really really hard to beat and and being stubbornly defensively, then they're going to Division Two because they play Kerry this weekend and the. Um, now Kerry aren't motoring fully themselves, uh, but you know that that win at the weekend might just give them a wee bit of an emphasis to kick on for the rest of Division One. Um, you know they'll want to get their house in order after the debacle against Mayo as well. But look, I, I don't think we can take anything away from the fact that Mayo's playing good stuff. They're playing really, really good stuff. Um, they've got a bit of energy behind them. Um, they'll always have, as you know, that crowd behind them as well. Um, you know they're fanatical supporters, so they'll 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 get that, you know they will get that fan base that that really drives them on, you know, and 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 that can be huge, you know, particularly this time of the year in the national league and stuff like that, you know, it, it can be absolutely huge, particularly when you've when you've home advantage, you know, and and, and Castle Bar's rocking and it's tough, it's 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 a tough place to go. A big game for Mayo this weekend as well, you know. The the, the one the one thing I will say with, with Mayo is. Like the one, not the concern, but basically that's without, I suppose, minus Tommy Connery who came on the, the last day and Killian O'Connor being the impact off, off the bench. Mayo, that's probably Mayo's strongest team throughout the start of that league. So that's only my one concern in terms of they are absolutely mortaring, they're flying. Um, but there isn't where you see other teams were chopping and changing a lot in terms of trying to, mm. I suppose, Build our squad a bit more in terms of their three or four coming in and out. That that that's pretty much been a settled team now. Obviously, look at, um, you know, they're trying to maybe the fullbacks may all McBreen and Brickerton seem to be swapping jerseys there every every second game. But like, uh, by the way, I do like McBreen. I think he's going to be an absolutely fantastic fullback. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I look at I agree with you. I agree with you, Stephen. I think um. They're, you know, they're, as you said, a new management team coming in. They seem energized or re-energized. They're they're kicking. Yeah. They're, you know, they have a good balance between the running game, and the kicking game. Even you know, um, my own club mates um, in the Hessian to to kind of to darts forward. You know, I love the way they kind of give and go in terms of changing the angle of attack and taking emphasis off the ball ball carrier where they they gave it that little five yard hand pass. I just don't think a lot of people talked about that. We say in the last few days how important that is to change that angle of attack and to take take the the emphasis off that the, the guy on the ball basically. Yeah, Inda will be a slight slight player, so he's he's quite smart. He doesn't want to bring the ball into contact, and like that little ten yard hand pass to Ryan O'Donoghue, Ryan O'Donoghue 
brings it back to him and you know the composure then uh, in terms of the goal the finish of the goal was was brilliant especially from a guy of such a young age like and even the the, the dart he made for for Edo's goal as well um you know again it was a give and go ball like so it's um look there's a lot of good stuff like a match as i said here i'm not going to crack open the champagne just yet but um <laughs> look at it, it's it's um look at kerry were more well last year you made a very good point as well we'll say because it's such a shortened season you have to be watering well you have to be um you know six months you know as you said you if you have a bad league i tell you what it would take some some mind games with the manager to tell a squad you're flying here you're going in the right direction if you have a poor league especially with a championship game two weeks time or a week's time after that no, here, I, I agree, and, and listen, and I don't see, you talked about sort of Mayo getting in with a bit of a settled team and, you know, maybe not, not rotating their squad as much as other teams, but I, I don't see that as a bad thing. Like, you know, you've got six, seven games in the National League to get your squad up to match fitness, you know, you, you probably won't have time for challenge games. You're straight into the championship after the league final. You know, someone said to me today, oh, Mayo might not want to be in a league final. Absolutely. Like winning winning is a habit, you know, and if you get into that winning mentality and that winning habit and, you know, that momentum, like a, I've been around squads where you've had that, you know, as a coach, you've had that energy. You come to training, players are energised. They've, they've come off the back of a nice win in the National League. You know, there's a bit of a feel-good factor. And I've also been in the camp where you're coming in with a couple of defeats and it's hard to lift things and you know you're trying different things you know and you're hoping and that you're you're hoping that it works you know you're sort of you're sort of you're sort of nearly in the situation where let's try him here and let's try this here and let's see if we can sort of tweak a few things here but if you're winning and all you're simply doing is just you know facilitating a, a, a coaching environment and players are coming buzzing and and everybody's chomping and those boys that are in the on the edges of it those boys that are in the periphery you know, they're the boys that are driving the thing on as well because they want in. They want a piece of it, you know. And, and I'm sure with the with the, the science that there is now, the sports science and the S&C men and the coaches that are involved, and I think Mayo's backroom team is, is nearly as big as their, as their playing squad at this stage. Like, But with the amount of coaches that they have and, and the amount of, of personnel they have there, the, the, the boys that aren't playing, they'll be well fit. Like, they'll be fit and, and flying and, and, and ready to motor, you know, if... If needed, you know, but but it's like anything. Like it's it's like winning. Winning becomes a habit. Momentum's a great thing. Like take for example, even the soccer. Like I'm I'm a big Manchester United fan. Like and you've seen the energy they got from the Barcelona victory. Like they didn't play well on Sunday. They didn't play well, but they went into the game believing they were going to win it. You know, and that that's that's a huge thing. That's a huge thing. And I think at the minute Mayo just feel just without getting without getting hysterical. I don't want to get hysterical and carried away, but there's nearly a wee bit of an invinci invincibility feeling around them where they think, you know, we fear no one now. And I would say they're looking through one eye at, at Kerry thinking, Jesus, Kerry's not going overly well. I would definitely say they're looking up the road to Dublin thinking, hey, what's going on up there? You know, so like that's not just going to come together overnight for Desi as well because they have a massive, massive game this weekend. You know, a massive game this weekend and, and having watched Derry at the weekend, I, I think Dublin will have their hands absolutely full at the weekend. Absolutely full. Yeah, no, I, I can't wait for that game, to be honest. It, it'd be, um, yeah. I will say, the case with Dublin, uh, there are, they are chopping and changing now. Um, they're yeah, bringing they four, four or five lads in, into the team every week. They they see probably Division 2 as, as a good place to blood the young lads uh, coming, yeah. or whatever's coming through there. But... Obviously, scraping over the line against Clare isn't. I don't want to be disrespectful to Clare here, like, but obviously, look at if you're if you're if you're wanting to be continuous with the All Ireland, it's you know, um, look at it is it is only only late February. I think we get a better gauge, see them maybe this time another month, uh, late late March, early April, yeah. where teams teams are exactly at like, but just like just finishing on on Taiwan and Mayo here, like uh, where. Do you think for for Tyrone, like, is it is the case that they're getting stuck between two stools here, like, as in they're not sure, like, uh, I'm not sure the defensive team anymore, or do you know what I mean? They're not really sitting there, you know, that defensive structure they used to get. To be honest, what I thought that was going to happen in in McKay Park on the last day was they were, they were going to get 15 in behind the 45, and they they did that to us. You say I'd say it was seven or eight years ago, and we found it very hard to break it down. But to me, it was uh, obviously they got they off, got off to a good start. But once the first goal went in, 
uh, against them. Their heads dropped. Mm-hmm. Uh, they fe- they seem very fragile in terms of their 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 confidence levels. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just I I I haven't seen Stephen such a drop off from All Ireland champions to this level of extent in terms of lads leaving the panel. It's only it's only eighteen months since they won the All Ireland. So you know, usually what happens is when you win the All Ireland, you kick on again. Lads get greedy. The squad gets greedy. I want a piece of this. But to me, what has happened here is the, the squad. Like to me, they're, they're happy. They've got their own To me, like they're they're content, and they 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 don't seem to push on at all. And I'd be very worried if I was the management team there. Like uh, I just, I just, I just find it very. I'm nearly confused when I'm looking at Tyrone. To be honest with you. Mm. No, listen. There's some there's some very good young talent coming through. You know, obviously young young Canavan uh, McLean from the under twenties, uh, young Adrian Cushes, young fella Connor Cush. You know, there's some brilliant footballers that are playing at, at underage level in Tyrone and 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 good forwards at that. You know, but I think you're right in what you're saying. I think there's maybe sort of a a, a call between two stools. Uh, I think Tyrone's strengths are you know a hard aggressive running game. I've always found Tyrone really really good. They're really good at ball retention. You know, they're really good at every everybody in Tyrone always seem to be, you know, a Tyrone County footballer always seemed to be really comfortable in the ball. Going back as far as Ryan McManaman, he was equally <laughs> as comfortable hanging out of a man as he was, you know, on the ball and, and, and breaking forward and kicking a point. And, and those Tyrone teams that got a lot of criticism, to be fair to them, they played a lot of good football. It's a bit like Derry. There's a narrative surrounds Derry, like, oh, they're wild defensive. No, what Derry have is a very clear, structured defensive game plan. You know, what Derry also have is a very clear, structured offensive game plan. You know, and if you go in without any sort of a structure or any sort of a template, you're, you're going to be cannon fodder. Like, look at Armagh at the weekend. Armagh went to Kerry. You know, they were probably fearing a, a backlash from Kerry from the previous weekend against Mayo. They went in with a very clear plan. You know, they retreated on the kickouts. They flooded the middle third. So they stopped Kerry building a running game. And from flooding the middle third, then they gradually developed into a sort of a deep line defensive system which stifled the space for Johnny O'Shea, David Clifford, you know, the, the inside forward and a carry. So, so Armagh went with a very clear, defiant game plan. Armagh didn't go there to keep the score down. Armagh went yeah. there to give themselves an opportunity to win the game. So to give yourself an opportunity to win the game, you need to be in the game. So what Tyrone did is they reached in a 5-1 lead. That was a perfect time to actually say, right, Let's drop off a few kickouts. Let's get ourselves set up in a really, really good rigid defensive system. And let's frustrate Mayo for 10, 15 minutes here. And if we can pick off two or three points in the break and go in 7 3, 7 4, or, or, or 8 5 up at half time, perfect. We're in a brilliant position in the second half. Mayo have to come out. The game will be stretched. And then you can express yourself through a kicking game or an offensive game and you can open up a wee bit as the game gets stretched. But if you're, if you're open from minute one, you know, you're just constantly, you know, you're giving yourself an awful platform to, to, to really, you, you know, to really chase from. And then I think that's a big problem in Toronto at the minute that they probably don't have, you know, that really aggressive defensive template that they've had in the past. And that's something that Toronto have always prided themselves on. You know, it's something that they've, they've built their success on. And look, at Anna, I'm going to be honest with you here now, regardless of what anybody says, Mayo have become very good at it. Mayo have become very good at it. It's common in the first three or four games of the National League. It's common of one of the best defensive records in Division One. You know, they've been organised. They've been hard to beat. You know, but they've given themselves opportunities to win. And that's the that's the key thing. And no matter what anyone says, whether it's Dublin, Mayo, Kerry, Tyrone, it doesn't matter what the frick you say, whoever wins the All Ireland this year will have a really strong defensive game plan. That's the bottom line. You know, regardless of what we feel, yes, you have to kick the ball, yes, you need good forwards. But if you don't have that defensive structure, aka Paddy Talley coming into Kerry last year, Paddy Talley was brought into Kerry for one earn and one earn only. Make us harder to beat. Make us harder to score against. Make us harder to to to, uh, to score goals against. And that's the reality. You know, Kerry realised, look, for us to win an All-Ireland here, yeah, we've got the forward part, but we have to find a balance. There has to be a balance, you know, and that's the key. And uh, I suppose it's like anything in life, just trying to find that little bit of balance between, between not being too defensive, but having that defensive structure and template to fall back on when needed, you know. Well, that, that actually leads us into the <laughs> we're around about defensive structures here. The the top five the top five defenders. So what like I I was I was kind of half not half laughing but like 
define a defender now because it there's there's all kinds of them in terms of you have your half backs in terms of you know i remember playing uh, johnny gall in 2012 the Ireland final and their half forwards were their half backs and their half backs were their half forwards uh you have yeah. obviously you know can you classify the likes of gavin white paddy durkin jack mccaffrey james mccarthy are they, are they defenders? They're attacking, you know, they, they obviously are. But you're not, you, I think you know the point I'm kind of getting at here. Yeah, no, um, I think, I think you're right. Look, I, I think what you're saying there, like, obviously, you know, from, from a, a defensive point of view now, what you tend to find is your defenders probably see a lot of a lot more ball than they would have seen in the past. You know, there's, you're obviously, I think, something at the weekend, I think somebody, it could have been into Hessian, I'm not sure, but there was somebody who ended up, like, at cornerback with, like, 50, 60 oh, possessions in the game. Tom, Tom, Tom. Tom, 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 Tom. Yes. Oh, Sullivan. Yeah. Oh, Kerry. You know, ended up with 50, 60 possessions. So, like, you know, you do need probably defenders that can defend and defenders that can play football. You know, I'm thinking, you talked to 2012, I'm thinking in the past of, you know, the likes of Philly McMahon, Johnny Cooper, Mick Fitzsimmons, who's still playing, uh, Neil McGee uh, from, from, from Donegal. You know, um, I'm thinking of, of um, what did you call him again? Uh, we corner back. He was absolutely... Uh, McFlynn, what was the other lad? Uh, oh, it's gone out of my head. The Donegal lad, I'm thinking about that 2012 team. Paddy, you know, but Paddy you, you had Paddy McGrath. You know, you you defenders who could properly defend, and you know, I go back to I go back into to you know, uh, like he's one of my favorite players at the minute in the soccer. Like we Martinez, you know, from Argentina, he just loves defending. Like like he celebrates a tackle or a block. You know, like a forward would celebrate a score. But there's very few probably real out out defenders. I would I'm I'm thinking of the likes of Chrissy McKeg from Derry who can go in and literally let let's lock a man away. Lock a man away. And McKeg's a freak in that capacity that he you know, he's very, very effective at that role. You know, Cooper could have done it, Fitzsimmons could have done it, uh, you know, Pothic O'Hara last year. Oshin Mullen, you know, but they were still very, very effective on the on on the front on the front foot as well, you know. And I think that that's that's something obviously, you know, you, you're probably taking into consideration when you're looking at a, at, a, at a defender now. It's not just good enough to probably mark a man, you know. Oh. You need to be competent oh. in the, on the ball as well, you know. So I, th- or, I think that's something to to consider. What 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 happens there, Steve, is like like everything else, uh, video analysis. If you're weak in the ball. Yeah, you know, they for the short kickouts. You know, if if yeah. they're getting a defensive structure there, they leave leave the worst man on the ball and let him come out with the ball, and yeah. he's trying to get rid of it. And yeah, you just can't get away with it anymore. It's it's the yeah. huge emphasis on on obviously uh, ball playing defenders. Uh, but as you say, getting that balance right in terms of, I think to be honest, I think Mayo had too many fucking going forward last year. Everyone wants to get forward and no one wants to defend. Like someone has to mind the house as well. There has to be some understanding there, or balances uh, would be the right word, as you said there, to to strike up when when you know uh, when you want to go forward. But um, yeah. So so who 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 are we saying so from the top five? Who who are you talking? If if I if you had to take five, oh we let's draw. We go six because it's six six in the back line. If you want to go six defenders, who would you go? Look, it's. Obviously, you know, you, you've... We've got, you've, we've got uh, this is like the All-Stars, actually. Right, well, like, well, well what, I, what I'm going to say to you, what I'm going to say to you here now is I'm looking at the three best defensive records in, in the four divisions, OK? Yeah. Um, Derry are the best defensive team in the country, right? So I'm looking at the likes of Chrissy McKeg, McCluskey. I'm looking at Podrick McGrogan. Podrick McGrogan's having a fantastic season from centre half back. Really, really good footballer. Brilliant footballer. So for me, the two from Derry are McKeg and, and McGrogan. Um, I think they're two brilliant, brilliant footballers. Um, I, I would certainly have both those two two players in my in my top five or six. In Cavan, uh, another team who are playing really, really well, knocking up big scores, but also defensively have been really, really measly. Uh, they're coming up against a down team this weekend who are scoring goals. So it'll be interesting to see if if Cavan can uh, can keep goal, Down's goal threat out because it's, it's probably what's what's keeping Down's promotion bit alive is their goal threat. But I'm looking at Potty Faulkner there, full back. Um, you know, an all star a few years back. Uh, Podrick Podrick's and Podrick's only 29, so he's coming into his peak years. An absolute an absolute warrior of a player. Um, you know, a, a real old school sort of fullback as well. You know, can can mind the square, can mark a man. Is good under high ball. Uh, Roscommon are the other team who are playing really well defensively. 
a lad who I've worked with in the past, who I rate very, very highly, probably as I, I've mentioned him a few times in the show, is Brian Stack. I think he's actually the captain this year of Roscommon. Stack, he's a fantastic defender. Brian has played wing half forward in, in DCU teams that have won Sickers and Cups, so he's equally as good on the ball and uh, as he is off the ball as well. Your own county there, obviously, Enda Hessian. Uh, I, I, I mentioned this man last week as well, Connor Loftus. New lease of life for Connor Loftus, you know, at centre half back. Um, I could be right in saying did Loftus not come into the team as a as a sort of a as a forward, as a corner forward Con- coming in? Con- corner forward, Brett Derry. Brett Derry actually the yeah. qualifier last minute goal back in yeah. was it sixteen or seventeen? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, but the one the no, one, the, one thing, the one thing though with the one concern I have with Mill is Connor is obviously new role for for him at centre back, uh, getting getting his reads right in terms of having that experience as a centre back. He is kind of stepping back in that sweeper role sometimes. Uh, that's going to be a pivotal role, especially in Crow Park. Uh, it'd be interesting how he gets on with it because that's gonna that's gonna be a big one there now in terms of uh, for for Mayo's progress in the championship. And I think also with um, with Mayo, I want to see obviously look at. They had two draws against Gawi and Armagh, but I want to see in terms of, you know, in when it comes to crunch time, I want to see a clear, a clear kind of offensive plan. With basically what I'm trying to say to you, when they all need a score, that they know, they know what they're doing in terms of as a collective. Before I think in the past, it's too, it was too individual. Uh, people were hoping um, they might get a free free shot. I don't think the uh, the hype is that we say, I just think about the Kerry game last year with Leroy. Leroy had a slicer outside the boot and put it wide. Um, yeah. There was a couple of games. Hoping, like hoping, that. For those, hoping, for those, uh, hoping for those magical moments where, you know, Mayo sort of feed off that, that sort of manic, manic last period of 10 minutes where it's, it's, it's nearly, the game's nearly taken a life of its own. Like, you know, rather than Derry, who are in total control of their offensive plays, like, you know, and. and exactly. Exactly. So, sorry, yeah. I, I stopped you in the moment there. We have McCabe, McGrogan, Faulkner, uh, Stack, Hessian, Connor Loftus. And probably Tom O'Sullivan's in there as well. I think I've named seven there in total, you know. Um, yeah. So, most teams playing with ten defenders now anyway, so seven's not too bad, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, hard. <coughs> it's hard to argue with that. It's, um, it's hard. When I was going down through the list, um, yeah, what's the story with Gavin White this year with Kerry? I haven't seen him at all. Is he injured? No, no. He, he could be listening. He could be getting an extended break. He could be doing a bit of conditioning. He could be rehabbing. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't followed yeah. it that closely. But I, yeah. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be overly sure of, of what the situation is with him. But um, for me, those boys that that I've mentioned are probably lads that are currently playing really well. You know, um, you know, particularly particularly when you look at the three best defensive records in the league. Obviously, yeah. defending is a collective rather than an individual thing. But those players are definitely are definitely a major part of, of, of those three teams' success, you know. So, like like the four for me, McKeag, McGrew, and Faulkner, Stack, you know, are, 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 are definitely, you know, nearly in a, nearly just in a, in a, in a, in a top bracket there. And then obviously in the Hesh and the Mayo, uh, you know, Loftus probably would throw them in. But probably if I was, if I was picking six, I'd probably go uh, Hesh and uh, Faulkner, McKeag. And then I would just go um, probably... Uh, Stack, uh, Stack, McGrogan, and Thomas Sullivan. If you know, him. yeah, 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 yeah. No, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't just agree with that. In terms of, um, you're actually interested. You mentioned Paddy there with with Kerry and the job, especially the, the job he's kind of done. Obviously, Ty Morley for Kerry. Uh, he's an integral part of that kind of that kind of system in terms of yeah. six dropping back. Like what? Like what? What? Like. What are you seeing there? Obviously, you he's he's a native uh, member of your county, like so. What's uh, any any background on Paddy, or what's his kind of his key principles, or anything you? Oh, well, Paddy, Paddy's, Paddy's a Galbally man. Uh, what a coach Tyrone in two thousand and three. Um, you know, obviously, when we're well aware of his background, you know, having won the All Ireland with Tyrone in two thousand and three, is a very young coach. Uh, he's a very successful record with St Mary's. I think what people associated Paddy with, you know, in, in his career is probably being a defensive coach. I, I don't really see him as a defensive coach. I see him as a football coach. Um, he knows how to make his teams very, very difficult to play against. 
Um, that's St Mary's team that won the Sigurdsson Cup, that a lot of really good footballers as well. Myler was in that team, Kevin McKernan was in that team, Corey Quinn from down as well, you know, that some brilliant footballers, Cole McCann and stuff and guys like that. So I um, think McGeary might have been in that team as well, but that some brilliant footballers uh, and it probably suited them to play that sort of counter-attack and style of game. Um, he came in and managed our own county down uh, for three years and one of the things he did do um, was 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 made down very very difficult to, to play against and you know like like I remember one game in particular uh, racing into a 10-1 lead against Cavan and, and the problem that just let down it was half time I think it was 10-1 they're nine points up in the championship ended up losing the game narrowly but I think what let them down that year was it was the year that, that Cavan actually um, it was the COVID year Cavan went on to win the, the Ulster yeah, title Ulster, yeah, I yeah. believe it had to down absolutely played them off the park and you know with a really fast counter-attacking game you know uh getting a lot of numbers back being very very stubborn defensively i think the biggest thing that let us down that year probably was our kick-out strategy but but it's horses for courses too you know we didn't have a david Morn or a or a, or a yeah. brian fenton to go and win a kick out you know down for some reason i've just lacked that that physicality obviously owen murdoch is a big one for the future now even though he's only 19 20 years of age Orn is obviously the next great white hope and down from a midfield perspective, but that probably what 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 one of Paddy's greatest traits was, you know, was was probably you know the 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 organisation of his training sessions, but also the intensity of his training sessions as well. You know, a lot of a lot of small sided games, a lot of hard running, you know, and 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 probably the lads really 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 enjoyed him, really liked him, and open speaking a lot of the players from twenty ten. He was also there in 2010 as well. Obviously, he went down last, got to an all Ireland final, and I know from speaking to a lot of the players back then, they would have they would have rated Paddy Paddy's coaching and 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 personality as well very highly. But that's the thing, uh, and uh, a down, you know, from a managing perspective, you know, maybe maybe some people are 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 better coaches than they are managers. I'm not suggesting that Paddy's not, but I'm thinking that the success that he's always had has come more so in a coaching capacity rather than a management capacity. So maybe it suits him and carry that role in the background where, you know, he's doing a bit of coaching. He's not in the in the firing line and, and, and Jack gets to take the the, the the hit, you know, if things go bad, you know. But uh but no he, he certainly has added a bit of steel to carry. Uh we've seen that last year. A bit of organization I think is the key thing probably, you know, being organized and, and I suppose obviously being a, a a PE lecturer in St Mary's as well. You know, it's part of his job to have high levels of organisation, and and that's what comes with the territory. So, yeah, he, he's 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 obviously been a, a major impact in Kerry, major impact. And well, I wonder what was himself and Jacko's connection there, Stevie, or any idea what that's like? It was, it was I, think, bit... I think I think there was a a, a connection in Kildare. I think uh, Paddy had taken a few okay. sessions with with Kildare under Jack. You know. Um, but I think that was that was that was a bit of a connection there. I, I don't know the full story ins and outs of it, but I do. I had heard a, a bit of a rumbling that if Jack had stayed with Kildare, Paddy would have been probably going to Kildare, you know, um, to with him. And and Paddy is probably Paddy is probably the ideal sort of the ideal sort of coaching uh, model that Kerry need or that Kildare need, you know, at the minute, like, because cause Kildare at the weekend were, were an absolute mess, an absolute mess. And I, I've got plenty of criticism on, on Shane's shows in the past before of, of being really hard on Kildare, you know, and, and probably the reason I am hard on them is because it warrants being hard on them. You know, I know, I know during my time at Harlow, like, it, it, you know, the embarrassing, like, what we did to them that day, you know, in Tullamore, like, I, I mean that sincerely, like, it was embarrassing, like, the Division 4 team could go against the Division 1 team in the Championship and bully them, like, literally physically and tactically bully them and, and beat them by, by 7, 8 points, whatever it was that day, I could have beaten them by, by 20 points if we had a, if we had a, you know, if it, if it had come to it, but, like, look, I, you know, I, I just feel at the weekend there and uh, major, major, major concerns over the way Kildare set up against Derry, like, major concerns like at this level of football with the analysis there is now with the tactical analysis with the, the scouting the coaching you know the backroom teams that these like these teams have all got these illustrious backroom teams you know i i love seeing all the names because for a lot of it it's just names you know and names and everybody has to have a big name now in their backroom team and you know yeah. if, if somebody gets you know a big name then somebody else oh we need one of them because they have them you know and yeah. and this is the thing but like everyone Everyone should be adding value in a management team, in my opinion. And you're sort of thinking to yourself, what possessed Kildare to set up against Derry the way they did at the weekend? Like, I, w I would love to know. I would genuinely love to know because they played against the Breeze. Derry played against the Breeze in the first half. 
and led by 10 or 11 points. Like, absolutely dismantled Gildare. Like, dismantled them. Gildare went man oh. to man. They were following very yes. wide. You know, <laughs> like they were they were allowing Derry to, to get cuts, to get loop runs, you know, to like Derry were, were getting a bit of depth in their attack and then all of a sudden they would empty the D and you know the those the likes of McGuigan and, and you know Ethan Doherty and these boys, they were just having an absolute field there. Like, you know, even even against a, a difficult setup and even against a defensive system, Derry are very, very Derry are very effective at breaking teams down. Like they did that day in Louth when I watched them. But go back to Colin O'Rook as well, like you know, another pathetic setup against Derry a couple of weeks before. Like, you know, Meath beat off the park as well. Like, so it's maybe not a Kildare thing. Maybe it's a Leinster thing. I don't know, you know, that, that there is that naivety still in Leinster. Honestly, I'm not being disrespectful. There probably is. I'd say to Dublin, like, you know, there is that naivety in Leinster. Like, you know, oh, sure, we're playing good football. You know, we're kicking the ball. You know, well, ultimately, it was a kick pass that that that, that cost me a game against, you know, uh, you know, they were down to 14 men that pushed up the field against Louth, and it's a game that's put them in a relegation battle. Promotion battle, you know, so it's 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 knowing when to express yourself and knowing when to make yourself difficult to beat, and that's the thing we talked about earlier in the show, you know. But it well, frustrates me, and it really frustrates me watching it. Like, really frustrates me, like because people will 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 beat you with a stick and say, "Oh, you were wild defensive when you were a Carlo." Like, what? What? We're organised. We're organised. If we had had a couple of decent, really, like if we had had two or three really, really top marquee forwards, like we could have we could have went to division two and stayed there easily you know you know the problem was you're relying on one forward like and when he get injured then you're in trouble you know and that's that's the thing like so if you're organized this this is my honest thing and if you're organized you're fit okay and and you and you manage your squad well as in you know a bit of man management you know and you communicate with players and you build a rapport with players and you create a nice cohesion and team spirit you, you can actually make massive gains at under county level Massive gains, you know, massive gains. But everybody needs to add value. There's no point in having all these illustrious names in your backroom team when they're just names. You know, they need to be adding value to it. And that's that's the key thing for me, you know. It's, uh, yeah, look, I I agree with you, Stephen. It's just in terms of, I suppose, if uh, any team now going man-to-man, to me, just, as you said, don't, don't have uh, a structure in terms of what we're on about here in terms of, you, you look at Kerry and Ty Money dropping dropping back and that's that's major that's obviously walkthroughs, that's obviously discussive meetings, that's obviously clear communication between your wing forwards and your midfielders. Uh, it's no coincidence that that Jacko when he came in went for went for two workhorses wing forwards with the likes of uh, Dara Moynihan and um Splan, yep. Adrian Splan was usually their, their first choice wing forwards and then you had Jim O'Connor and well, it was David Moore in midfield, in midfield last year for them. That's four across the middle. And it allows Ty Morning then to drop back because, like most teams, you know, if most teams want to kick the ball, and if that first kick pass isn't on, Ty Morning's cutting out that first primary possession or that primary ball, well, then everything slows down and you get more men back. And then, then the good teams, um, the, the well coached teams, can break down that mass defense. But the majority of teams still in the country, Stephen, cannot break down that man's defence. And when you cut out that primary primary ball going into the full forward line, well, mm-hmm. then a lot of teams are in trouble. So it just shows to me that Meads, like Cullum, obviously, you know, he's a traditionalist, but that day, that day is gone. And uh, you can't, like, you can't leave, you can't leave your full back line exposed like that. Uh, throughout the 70 minutes because it only takes one mistake uh, you know from from your a slip from a full back or a corner back and you're in a goal and especially look at it against quality players as you said with the likes of McGuigan and Ethan Doherty like them boys can't be left one on one without you know if, especially without a man between them and the ball in terms of a sweeper or something trying to get them back but yeah. um, it's just look at It'll be, look at Dublin. Dublin, I think Dublin and the Pomp did it very well with Keno Sullivan and and Jura Brennan uh, with the with the six yeah. dropping back and serious communication between themselves and the midfielders. But look, that's a squad. That's a collective thing. You just you're not going uh, like to me. Daily actually, David Burns was in last year with Kildare, he, and we were having this conversation with Kildare as well. And he did say that like that Kildare have an unbalanced forward line where they don't have workhorses with the two wing forward spots. They're kind of like, they're kind of like 11s and full forwards, generally corner forwards that, you know, they don't have mm-hmm. that kind of, you know, wing forwards now at this, this moment in time are basically, uh, 
a cut off of a midfielder. They're just literally, yeah. you know, there might be a small, an inch or two too small for midfield or and, uh, their work. Kildare, Kildare, have, Kildare have fantastic athleticism, right? They've got all the attributes physically. Right, they've really, really good athletic footballers. Like you know, you think of the likes of Daniel Finn and those guys. Really good athletic footballers, right? When, when, when we were looking at, them, I'll, give, I'll give an example of of what you're looking at as a coach, right? So when I went and and critiqued them on their videos, they were playing Division One National League that year. We were playing Division Four. So when I looked at them, I realised that they've got a very athletic middle third, right? Yeah. They have a very athletic middle third. So we were pressing every kick out in Division Four that year. We got seven goals actually from a zonal press on opposition kickouts. Seven goals, right? Yeah. And, and you know, throughout the course of the season, but we decided that day for the first time all year that we were going to drop off the kickouts. So people on the outside that don't understand that, why are you dropping off the kickouts? So if we press Kildare's kickout, right, and we're man to man, and they win that ball in the middle third, they have greater athleticism than us, right? So we're going to take out one of their strengths. So big Kevin, Kevin uh, Field in the middle of the field, brilliant fielder of the ball. You know, we, we had lost Brendan Murphy to America as well, our primary fielder of the ball. So we had a smaller midfield plane. So we had to find a different way to overcome that. So what we did was we dropped off to the 45. We let Kildare have the ball at the back and we used our inside forwards to nearly channel Kildare down the sidelines. So that allowed us then defensively to get organized on the other side of the field and nearly condensed the pitch into two-thirds. So we were defending two-thirds of the pitch. When Kildare shifted the ball across to the opposite side, we shifted across a defensive unit. Now, I can't begin to tell you the work that went into that end of, you know, in the two weeks preparation leading up to that match. We played in-house games where we played 19 players against 15 to replicate extra bodies coming about to make sure that our 15 were really in sync of what they're doing. And we were outstanding that day. Absolutely outstanding. For the first 10 or 11 minutes of the game, you know, Kildare never had a sniff. Uh, you know, they never created a goal chance. You know, they, it, so people need to understand why teams drop off kickouts. People need to understand why teams press kickouts. So we would have went in against, so for example, just for talk, it's for talk's sake, in the same year, we would have we would have went in against Louth in the championship, for example, right? And we would have realised that if we get after the Louth kickout, we feel that we've got a superiority on Louth in the middle third. And we did press a lot of Lowe's kickouts and got a lot of joy in Lowe's kickouts, you know. And that's the thing. It's horses for courses. So it's knowing, it's examining your opposition, realising what their strengths are. So if I was playing against Derry tomorrow morning, you look at the way Derry's attack is, right? They get that height, they get that depth. You know, they create those 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 real and incisive cut runners coming off the sideline. They have a lot of strike runners coming from late. So if you were playing against them, what are you going to do? You're not going to go man to man and follow them out wide. You're going to play. You're nearly going to try and condense the pitch and play more zonally. You know you're going to try and crowd your D obviously as well. You're going to try and stifle goal chances. How are you going to do that? Well, you're actually going to maybe even step off a man. So if you if you're marking Ethan Doherty, you would nearly let Ethan Doherty take the ball in the loop because if you get so close to Ethan Doherty, he's going to do a backdoor cut and he's going to be gone and that chance is going to open up. So when you're defending Ethan Doherty inside, you would nearly say to your full back, give him four yards. Just give him four yards. And a, and a worst case scenario, concede a score, concede a point, but do not concede goals. You know, and that's that's where Derry's big energy lines are. You know, they're getting goals. You know, they're very very good at creating those chances. You know, and and obviously <coughs> we talked about him last week. So they have a marquee forward like Shane McGuigan is the most informed forward in Ireland right now. You know, like if you think of Clifford, who is maybe not motoring fully, Shane Walsh isn't back. This man's the best forward in Ireland at the present moment in time. You know, there's no there's no doubt about it. You know. Yeah, like in, in yeah, so like, like I suppose with those teams, like you know, you're saying a lot of marquee names going into the into the back backroom teams. But I know myself, Stephen, as a as a former player, like you you'll always give look and you always give management teams that you know the the three four months and then kind of the realization comes to you or comes to the squad. Well, this is you know. We're we're going some places here, and or the other side of the coin is this isn't going so well, and you know a bit of disillusionment uh, comes into the the whole setup. Like, but you know, I suppose look at the first year, like they'll always get a kick out of the first year, and obviously look at year two, it, it kind of goes downhill from there. And yeah, it's just going to be interesting how they, you know, Glenn Ryan's this is this is second year, isn't it in, in Kildare? Uh, is it second year, year two? Third year. Third year. Year, year three. Year three. 
Yeah. So like it's it, it is, is like this. So part of back to Kerry last year, year two is it? It's year two. Year two, year two. So this is a massive year. Like Kildare, yeah. as you said there, Kildare, like Kildare supporters are as fanatical as Mayo. They are they are hungry for success in, in Kildare. They're absolutely like they're well resourced yeah. as well, absolutely well resourced. So like you see, I, I just you're talking about management uh, teams. I'm going to throw something at you as well, which which is very very underlooked at times. Very, very underlooked. Within a playing squad, you need dynamics, right? You need good cohesion. We talked about this last week, right? Your number, your number 27, you know, to number 35 that maybe aren't really going to make it, right? They need to be a good dynamic, right, to create that spirit. But equally, Enda, equally, you need a good spirit in your management team, right? And people forget this. You need cohesion and togetherness within your management team because there's a, if there's not cohesion and togetherness, Players also pick up on that. If there's mixed messages, if, if someone's not coming in with the same mindset as you. So as a manager, I, I have a I have an idea of how I want my team to play. I have an idea of where my team needs to improve. Right. So when I'm looking for a coach to come in and work with me, I want to make sure that, that coach has got a good personality. I want to make sure that I'm going to get along with him. I want to make sure that he's or, going to be or, singing or from a similar, similar philosophy. Like a lot of these, uh, like especially in, exactly. especially you know, yeah, with the with the management teams being set up, I I know for a fact that some people actually just throw the name in, as in, oh, he's a big name, throw him on, on my ticket here, and they, they, haven't, they haven't they haven't spoken a word to each other. So how no. does it do you know? How do you know you have the same philosophy in, in football or the same ideas? What yeah. you want, you could be opposites. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, and like I I I'm fortunate. Obviously, the people I've worked with in the past. You know, at club level, at county level, I still have a great relationship with all of them. I don't think there's anyone that I wouldn't have a good relationship with. Yeah, but really, I've always enjoyed working with the people that I've enjoyed with, or that I've that I've that I've experienced. You know, coaching with. I've always had that that good relationship. But I've also been in one or two setups where the dynamics haven't been perfect. You know, they just haven't been perfect, and there's maybe just been a bit of mixed messaging, etc. And that leads to not an access, successful environment. And that's the key. You know, you, you need, your dynamics and your management team need to be good. They need to be good. And and as you say, just throwing a management team together because, you know, they have a big name or they're a former player. Because a lot of people coaching now who, you know, probably haven't coached, you know, at any real significant level and are and are being propelled in the inter-county level. And it's, it's madness. Like, it's madness. When yeah. you think of, when you think of something, when you think in soccer, how difficult it is to get your 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 A B to get your your pro coaching license. When you think how difficult that is for a player, like for example Stephen Gerrard, who's who's still who's relatively young and in, into the management circles, but he would have had to do all his awards, work very very hard to get his awards, and then obviously he was very very fortunate to get a break <laughs> at Rangers. What a GAA. Just because you played for, for, for Dublin or something, you know, people's knocking on your door and saying, will you, will you come in and, and, and coach us? Coaching is an art form. You know, it's not a science. You know, working with people is a skill. Managing people is a skill. Building relationships with players is critically important. It's probably one of the most important skills of management and coaching, creating relationships. If you, you know, treating your players, getting to know your players as people rather than players, and that's the key thing. And, you know, a lot of people have this misperception. I know for a fact there's inter-county setups. I know for a fact inter-county setups right now where the manager won't communicate with the players and its communication is done through other avenues. How can you create a spirit and dig in a group managing like that? You know, and that's... Well, that's, 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 uh, that's common, Stephen. In, in my mind, to a player, man, that's very common. Yeah. I, so a lot of managers yeah. just do not want that confrontation, and like they they let you know exactly they let you know right yeah uh throughout the season they let you know if you need a kick them the if they don't think you're going well they will put you on the 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 B the B team or they'll you know there might be mini yeah. games uh during during the week before before the A B B and you know they mix up the teams but you know you're on the the other the, the B team as well so they. They, they they know they know that way. Now there is the, the, the other side of the coin saying like oh yeah, communication is fine, but too much communication is nearly a bad thing as well. I don't know what what you think of that. Um, sometimes sometimes players need that chip on their shoulders and basically well fuck you. I'm gonna fucking I'm gonna prove you wrong here. You absolute 
Just, uh, that that would be my mentality now. Like, I, mean, I didn't. To me, I didn't need a lot of communication with the manager. Like uh, in terms yeah. of, I just, I like, I didn't like to do a lot of talking. I just wanted to fucking just, you know, do my stuff on the pitch and let that do the talk and 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 screw everything else. I just think, and it's changed times. I, I, and, and I'm speaking as a teacher, you know, I, I see the way society's going. I see the way young people are going now. You know, there's a lot more obviously going on in young people's lives that, that like our lives were more, well, I'm not putting you in the same age bracket as me, like, but my life was a bit more simplistic when you were younger. You know, you, you, when you were 13, 14, you were building three houses and playing football in the street. You know, but that's the reality. Like, you're 13, 14 year olds not doing that anymore. 13, 14 year olds no. now are running discos and they're looking at social media and they're on Instagram and stuff. And it's a big, big, there's an awful lot going on there. And there's, a, I don't want to label every young person like this, but there's a real neediness among players now, a real neediness for love and, and, and communication. And, and, you know, tell me, tell me I'm going well, you know, tell me I'm, 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 I'm okay. You know, there's nearly that, they nearly need that reassurance and, you know, there's nearly that reassurance arm around the shoulder and we're we're becoming a very very fickle society in general you know where everyone's insulted by everything you know you, you can't say the wrong thing now in case in, in case you insult anyone you well, know and that's but, that, that's that's, but to, to, to me to me sorry to cut across you but to, to me Stephen like that like to me an intercounty setup is a bullshit free zone that shit of you know uh, being sensitive and you know fickle like you know let's cut the bullshit here in terms of right if you have to call someone out, let's call them out in terms of you're not doing your job. You need to, you know, you, you know, there's 30 members of the squad here. Like, yeah. I, and I, I will say, like, in terms of the, I, I don't want to, I don't want to be just disrespectful here to the other counties, but the, the top, I can guarantee you the top four or five counties, the bigger, bigger squads, they, uh, their communication, I would hazard a guess, would be quite limited because they have fucking other pairs to come into the team here and, you know, you're very, very expendable, if you know what I mean. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, well, I listen here. Look, the, the greater your resources, I suppose, you know, the, the, the more you can play about with that. But look, I would say I would say that, that there's still there is still some sort of level of communication. And maybe why maybe that's one of the reasons why these performance coaches are being brought in and these life coaches are being brought into setups, maybe to keep that level of communication and to, you know and, and think. But I think no matter what you say though, and I think no matter what you say, like that that for you to play hardball with a player or, or be nice to a player, or put the armor in a player, that that's built up, you know, through trust, through honest conversations, through, you know, getting to know your players. Like, so the first thing, I, I listened to Eddie Howe's podcast last week, okay? High performance yeah, podcast, yeah. Eddie Howe. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating podcast. Fascinating podcast. He talked about the first thing he did when he arrived at Newcastle was he only knew three players, right? So the first thing he did was he did one to ones. I, I, I do that with every squad I work with. Okay, I do one to one straight away. First thing, I've always done that one to ones. It gets you to know the person on a personal basis straight away. It's a personal touch straight away. And the house things. Have you a family? Are you at university? What are you doing? How's work going? You know, are you at school? Brilliant. What are you doing? What exams are you doing? Straight away, bang. Just get to know a small bit about that player. You know, and I think that's vitally important. And, and I think it's overlooked. You know, I think a, a lot of it is overlooked now, and everybody that. thinks it's worth it. Yeah. It's a, sorry, it's a massive sorry. part of it. It's a massive part of it. You know, it's a huge, huge part of it. I think that I think that a lot of that sometimes is overlooked. You know, and this sort of uh, will we'll play hardball and and will you know will make him fucking work for it. But you don't know what's going on in that person's life. You don't know how, if he's having a really tough day in in, in work. If he's split up with his, in his relationship, is his relationship still as strong? You know, all those things end that can be can be playing on a on a young person's mind now. Because here, there's very few players playing now into their thirties. Let's be honest, you know, it, yep. the inter-county scene is a young man's game. You know, the large, large proportion of inter-county setups now are young players, young people. You know, and it's vitally important that you, you, you treat these young people with, with, you know, with the respect. And, 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 and obviously, you know, you, for me, you, you build relationships. That's a massive, massive part of it, building relationships, you know. I, I, I a, a thousand percent agree with you, uh, Stephen. I... I just I wouldn't have now look at I've had one one on one before um, with managers, um, but that level of that level of relationship w was wasn't there in terms of I never I never yeah. got the impression that you know they they cared about my my personal life in terms of had I a girlfriend I, I I was going they know I was going to college maybe but in terms of family you know even 
uh, how many is in your family? Do you have siblings? Stuff like, do you know what I mean? I'm not like, yeah. In, you don't have to get into that in depth of stuff, but like, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, th- I think a player would, if that sense of that sense of care uh, came into, you know, that, you know, obviously there's 30, 35 players on the squad. You're not going to keep everyone happy, but it is important to build up a certain amount of the, a certain amount of that kind of relationship to that that I don't know what what it is, but I think. I think a player would would play harder. For, I would anyway. I think you play harder for that management team because because of that care factor. I don't want to sound too like you know too I don't know uh, flaky here, but I think I, I think you're you're right, Stephen. But I, I don't think I would ha- I would love to know. I would love to know the stats on that in terms of management teams, even this year throughout the thirty two teams and the hurling teams and the hurling management teams. What level? they'd get to know their players. Now, obviously, they have massive mm. backroom teams. Maybe the life coach are saying there, maybe that's their role. Uh, but at the end of the day, the manager, you know, the book stops with the manager. And the, the player, let's be honest, the player really only cares about the manager's opinions and the coach. The, to me, the coach and the manager yeah. de- decides your fate in terms of are you going well? Do they rate you? Um, so, yeah, no, it's look, it's an interesting conversation. I don't think... Yeah, it's it's yeah. It, I think it's a different angle. I I like it to be honest, but I yeah. That's look. That's only my experience. I could be totally wrong here to be honest with you. Yeah, you have, you have, you have your own your own experience, and it's just I find it fascinating to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. No, listen. I, I think that's the beauty of coaching. You know, everyone has their own sort of outlook on it, and 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 what works for them and what doesn't work for them. You know, and some people will. We'll run a ship and we'll run a camp where communication is very, very scant. It's it's very scarce, you know, and, and other people will have yeah. obviously that more personal personal touch with them, you know. So interesting. One for another night, maybe. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. Look, we have finished on that note. Uh, look, looking forward to the next week's games. And sure, look, um, look after yourself and we'll chat to you next week. Yeah. Good morning, Chat to you soon. Cheers, Stephen. Cheers, man. Thanks, mate. Bye, bye, bye.